post office. And in any case, we should be trying to inculcate a proper phone culture in this country. So um, what, and we said, be careful before you do that. And he said, what difference is it going to make? You know, if you allow people to respond by post, they'll respond by post. If you allow people to respond by phone, they'll respond by phone. Either they want the product or they don't. And we said, do not assume that. It'd be very easy to assume that. It would sound perfectly rational. It ain't true. And so sure enough, um, we did a test where 50,000 people got at, selected at random, got phone only. 50,000 people got post only. And 50,000 people were given a choice between the two. And I can't find the exact figures because, my God, it's 30 years ago, okay? But the, um, the results were something like post response only, 5% response to selling a product at a given price. F phone only response, 1.9, 2%, phone only. If you offer people the choice, it was 69 so within 0.1% of being the sum total of offering one or the other. And okay, economists, economists aren't blind to the possibility of, um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> economists aren't blind to what they call transaction costs. In that obviously, you know, if you said, uh, you know, you can buy this product for four pounds a month, but you have to walk over the cultures, then they would expect fewer people to respond. But equally, this wasn't that big a difference. It was pick up the phone, free, because it was a free phone number, or return the envelope, free, because it was a free post, or choose the two. And what astonished us was that effectively, by trying to mandate the mode of response, you were basically throwing away everybody who preferred another mode of response which when you think about it is really really weird um you know basically you think well do i want this product and then when you've decided you go oh how do i order it but it wasn't working like that at all and so one of the reasons interestingly why that was important is one of the reasons i got very excited by the internet when some people were skeptical was i simply said if you create a medium through which people like ordering things, you will sell a hell of a lot. So taken at a kind of pattern recognition level, that kind of experiment in a direct marketing agency in London in 1992 sort of predicted the rise of Amazon. And because, um, you know, in a sense, Amazon, to be absolutely honest, okay, mail order in England in the Edwardian era wasn't far off Amazon, nor was it in America in the 20s and 30s, where you had um, at Montgomery Ward, the, the two giant companies that dominated it was Montgomery Ward and somebody else, Marshall Field. They were the two. Marshall Field and Montgomery Ward had something like, I think they did quarter of a million dollars worth of business a week in the United States in the 20s. And you could sit there. Now, the reason, of course, in the US it was big, because if you lived in the Midwest, the nearest town where you could buy anything interesting might have been sort of 70 miles or 100 miles away. And you could buy things online back then. In 1910 in England, you could buy Sears as well. Thank you. Sears Roebuck as well. Um, you, you could actually buy a canoe or, I mean, you can actually, my parents might have kept, but you can buy in hardback the Army and Navy stores mail order catalog for Christmas 1912. And if you think that this is the golden age of consumerism, the Edwardian age in a weird way was just as extreme. I mean, the kind of stuff you could buy and the range of stuff you could buy. I mean, it includes guns, by the way. I mean, this is a British catalog, not an American catalog. It includes a large range of guns, canoes, boats. I mean, the, and so in an interesting way, what, what I think made Amazon so successful, it wasn't that this, what, this mode of commerce hadn't been possible in the past. It just made it particularly agreeable psychologically to go, ooh, I like that, add to basket, click. In a way that filling in a form and then posting it, you know, with the addition of another sort of 48 hours delay if you're in the United States, didn't have that quite immediate hit, which Amazon does. And also, I think, by the way, the, the other thing that Amazon did, which was a work of genius, was Amazon Prime, where you don't pay for shipping. Um, uh, you don't pay for shipping uh, if you buy a reasonable amount of things. It makes more sense just to pay one flat annual fee. 
The reason that's important is that without Amazon Prime, Amazon can't really have frequent customers. Because if you're buying 10 things a month, and you're paying $3 or $4 every time for two day shipping. It, you, it just adds up to, you know, it's just too painful. And, um, and someone, your point about the comments, by the way, and the ratings is undoubtedly true. Ratings undoubtedly help. They can hinder a bit, but mostly they help. When I said ratings can hinder is there is always that danger uh, of order effects. If you launch a new brilliant product and the first person leaves a, leaves a bad review because they happen to get unlucky, you, th there are things that worry me about ratings, which is that either they can be exploited maliciously by competitors or that um, uh, there's a very bad order effect. I met someone who was on Airbnb and her first ever house guests were assholes. Okay. So she puts it on Airbnb. Funny enough, it's a party of doctors. Now you'd think a party of doctors would be really nice house guests. It doesn't surprise me to know that doctors in their spare time, you know, you spend most of your working life feeling really worthy and important and saving people's lives. Probably when you get a week in a villa, you behave like a bit of a tit, to be honest. So anyway, it was a whole party of doctors and they were totally unreasonable. You know, they complained that they didn't have exclusive use of the house and swimming pool, despite the fact that it was clearly documented. They expanded the party from nine to 14 at the last minute. And then when she charged them a bit of extra cleaning money, they left her a negative review, which is totally unfair because there were more people than originally quoted for. But I said to her, I'm terribly sorry, but you've got this one terrible review. The only thing you can do is change the name of your house and start all over again. Um, so, but I agree with you that actually in some respects, the reviews are very helpful. And so what's so interesting in, in direct marketing is you very quickly realize that in order to sell things to people and in order to innovate and in order to get people to adopt new products, the battle is as much psychological as it is technological. And I always argue that in the whole process of innovation and improvement, the component of innovation that gets the lowest level of attention is really marketing. That in order to get someone to stop doing something they did before, by the way, and so Andy Milson has just said, charging shipping on any order over 70 pounds doesn't really make sense. I kind of agree with you, by the way. Um, that you might argue that once you're spending 70 pounds, the margin on any product and the fact that you don't have massive retail overheads should be enough to offer free shipping. There is, of course, sometimes a reason for free shipping, if you think about it, uh, for not having free shipping in the fashion industry. Um, you don't want too many returns. Because if you have free shipping in the fashion industry and you have free returns, there's never present risk that people just get into the habit of ordering a shoe in four sizes and sending them three, three of them back. And you're right about, you know, there can be weight. So it's very contextually sensitive. But there are certain categories where I agree with you that to charge shipping seems unreasonable. Um, there are certain categories where actually the context means that it makes sense. But, but I think... Um, I think what's so interesting about that is that marketing and psychology, I would make a case that I can certainly list $10 billion businesses where unless you actually include psychology in the list, there are insufficient reasons to explain their success. And so Starbucks would be an interesting case in point, okay? If you looked at the US coffee market and you looked at it in 1990, Starbucks, I think, got started in the late 80s, early 90s, but it got big roughly in, I think, the, the 92, 93. Now, if you've gone around asking Americans, would you pay $3 for a cup of coffee? 95% of them would have said no, and 5% of them would have said no, but in e even ruder terms, they would have told you to piss off, okay? And I think Starbucks is in part... And if similarly, if you looked at the coffee market, you would have had, you probably would have seen what people pay for coffee and you would have seen a kind of normal distribution, a kind of bell curve that suggested, yeah, there were some weirdos who basically would spend $3 on a coffee, but it was at, you know, really, you know, really exclusive hotels, but it was right at the fringes of what people would do. Okay. And you would have seen that the mainstream coffee market was probably around the $1.50 mark or something back then. And um, uh, very good point from Melina, by the way. I think that's absolutely true. It stopped me buying things in the past, uh, which had you actually listed them at a higher price but with free shipping. Because we tend to frame the, the purchase price as something that contributes to the physical good, 
which is an eternal benefit, whereas the shipping cost is where we're paying for something effectively um, intangible. And, um, but with Starbucks, okay, there's no evidence to suggest that that market existed um, in the United States before 1990. And what I think changes everything is that if you have a store that only sells coffee, um, what we'll pay is fundamentally different versus when we're buying coffee from a place that also sells food. And so, so that, that's the kind of thing where I would argue that, you know, if I, I'll happily make a list and it's an espresso, Starbucks, Dyson, um, Zoom, by the way, um, Uber, there's another one I've forgotten, which I keep forgetting, but I'll think of it in a moment. Um, there are a whole host of, of new and hugely successful products where their success, I think, in reality, is more because they stumbled on a psychological quirk of human nature. And I call it a quirk, not a bias, by the way. I think quirk is a much better word because bias presumes that economic theory is right and human behavior is wrong. And that's a very, very unsafe assumption because economic theory doesn't understand the wider context in which people are operating or the evolutionary forces that led to particular preferences. And so, but, but I, I would argue Uber's great quirk is the fact that people find it inordinately less painful waiting for a taxi if they can see the taxi approaching on the, on the map. That actually it's not duration that hurts us about a wait, it's uncertainty. And so that's the kind of thing where, and, and, you know, I think we've got to be very careful about using the word bias because they're quirks. They're quirks because we don't even expect them in ourselves in many cases. Yes, it is re well, it's reframing biases, but in a way that the word bias is automatically pejorative. And I think it's also automatically defensive when used by economists because what you're doing is you're, um, A, assuming that the economic model is correct and that any deviation from it is something to be corrected. I would argue simply that any deviation from the economic model that's widespread is something that needs to be understood and that may be necessary to, ref it may suggest there's a necessity to refine your model. So for example, the ergodicity area of inquiry in mathematics, which Ole Peters is leading in London, which I'm proud to say I discovered fairly early because I've got a friend who's a mathematician. That argues that if you look at expectation and probability correctly, um, prospect theory, um, loss aversion, even sunk cost bias are not irrational. So it's completely wrong to call them a bias. And you might call them an apparent anomaly or you could call them something a bit silly like a quirk. But actually, if evolution's right and economics is wrong, using the word bias to describe the human behavior when really the bias lies in the economic model because it's got its maths wrong okay um, that's a very dangerous misuse of language i think and mental accounting by the way makes sense you're up oh, oh my goodness it's lashes off fantastic you would know yeah mental accounting and apportioning of separate things also makes sense in a non-ergodic environment so um uh, absolutely true and i'd long suspected that somehow funnily enough I'm a bit odd on this one because I think the phrase sunk cost bias is useful. And I think the phrase sunk cost effect is certainly useful because on one or two occasions, I found myself on the point of doing something stupid, I think, because of sunk cost bias. Okay. And there's a wonderful example of this, which is my wife and I had booked non-refundable air tickets to Brussels uh, and a day beforehand we were both very ill with flu and we were planning to go anyway um this is way before coronavirus because we bought the goddamn tickets and i said hold on a second if we hadn't bought these tickets would we be planning a trip to brussels we're going to spend money on hotels we're going to spend money on museum visits and all the while we will be less happy than if we were merely staying at home overdosing on lemsip and wrapping up in a continental quilt so is this really a sensible use of additional money to do something that's less pleasant than staying at home just so we feel we didn't waste these tickets? In the event, by the way, I sent the tickets back and got the tax refunded so they cost only half of what I thought they cost. Uh, and so in many cases, what the, erg the ergodic um, economics or ergodicity economics does 
is it suggests, I mean, that's a useful thing. Uh, you know, asking that question, did my friend suffer from sunk cost bias there? But on the other hand, in evolutionary terms and in non-ergodic terms, there are reasons why continuing to invest in something that's non-recoverable from your past makes disproportionate success. And so we've got to be very careful about this. This is a kind of, this should be considered an equal debate between, mathema between good mathematics and uh, a, a, an evolutionary understanding and observation of behavior where we don't go into this battle presume, presuming that one of them is more intelligent than the other. Because I think, you know, there's often a phrase among evolutionary psychologists that evolution is cleverer than all of us. And the product of, you know, a few million years of embedded wisdom shouldn't be discarded that readily. A very simple level, I was at the government and they said, how do we encourage young people to get more pensions? And I said, look, there are lots of ways you can make pensions less repellent to young people. Not least, I think, Shlomo Bonazzi and Richard Thaler's idea of the Save More Tomorrow pension, which I think would work very successfully on younger people. Because younger people are cash constrained and something that re reduces future gains rather than reducing present income is going to have more appeal. I also think that for young people, you need to make pensions recoverable. Because you'd feel an idiot if you're unable to go on the best holiday of your life with your mates while you had 20 or 30,000 sitting in a pension which you weren't going to see for another 35 years. Or worse still, you couldn't repair your car and therefore you couldn't get to work because you had 20,000 pounds in a pension. That would be stupid. So you need to make the first 10,000 pounds of a pension draw downable at any point for the first 10 years. That's a really significant point which no one spotted. But my final advice was, again, to the cabinet office, do not expect people in their 20s to invest in pensions at the rate you think is rational, because at the age of 20 to, tw to 35, maybe people's prime priority is finding a high quality life partner, okay, in Darwinian terms, not optimizing long-term savings. And I said, now, I don't want to be rude, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet, I've never been on Tinder because I was married before it existed, but I'm pretty confident if you go on Tinder, not many people start off their Tinder profile by describing their pension provision, okay? As I once said, you know, if rationality were all that valuable in evolutionary terms, accountants would be sexy, wouldn't they? And for some reason in evolution, we don't find, you know, rationality and sensibleness entirely attractive in the opposite sex. You know, if we did, you know, you know, male strippers would dress as accountants or actuaries. They don't, they dress as firemen. And I think there's something significant about that. And so if you're trying to optimize your attractiveness, a big pension has almost no, um, unless you're trying to date someone who's, you know, really, really weird, okay, a big pension has very little, little appeal, okay? And indeed, if you went out on a date with someone who said, well, first, before I talk about you, let me talk about my 401k, I think your reaction would be, mm, where did I leave my coat, to be absolutely honest? And so you have to factor in these things. You know, we have different priorities at different life stages. So you, now, anyway, you said you've got some questions, so I'm very, very happy. In fact, I'm much happier, you know, I do a lot of talking with podcasts and book talks. So questions and indeed, please, criticism, abuse, um, you know, nicely framed. Uh, anything like that is also really, really welcome. Oh, thank you, um, Rory. That was something. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, um, it's too late right now to say thank you for being here because I think I've been here for quite some time. Uh, there were a couple of questions that we actually compiled over a, a week um, and that we were planning to ask them. But I think what we will do is, uh, you know, we'll have people put up their question on the chat box straight up and then you can pick up uh, the ones that you like the most. But uh, now that we have, like, what you want to do is ask uh, two quick questions, right? Can I, before I start, can I start with a very, very funny story about live chat, which is, it was actually a, a Zoom webinar and there were five of us who are panel participants and there were about 100 people in the chat. And suddenly we were spammed with gay porn, okay? So suddenly the chat panel goes absolutely bonkers and starts talking about the Ram Ranch where naked cowboys are walking around 
you know, and describing various aspects of the naked cowboy's genitalia, okay. And this suddenly starts flooding up on the chat screen. Anyway, I then needed to ask a question of everybody uh, in the audience. Uh, and I didn't realize that this spamming had only gone to the panelists, not to the audience. So I started my question, ignoring, leaving the Ram Ranch aside for a moment and forgetting about naked cowboys, I was wondering if the speaker had any opinion. And of course, the, the 67 people who hadn't seen the screen because they weren't on the panel, basically were left thinking, this guy's a total lunatic. Okay? Why is he talking about naked cowboys? <laughs> Apropos of nothing at all. So anyway, if I do start talking about something weird, okay, it's because of that. Okay, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure uh, uh, we control the chat, but if it turns on someone, it turns on someone, right? Fair is fair. Now, uh, there were two quick questions that we uh, wanted to ask you. And at some point of time, as you give the answer, we would love to hear the story of a dictaphone. It's a recent story you shared somewhere. I think it's very relevant here, uh, given the fact you had asked us two questions. Fantastic, thank you so much. So you had asked us two questions uh, in the video you made us. We wanna touch that. We wanna hear the story of a dictaphone. And then uh, there's an important question you wanna ask uh, you know, out here. I think this will be the only question we'll ask. And the rest of the questions are going to be straight up coming on the chat box. I think that's fair. People have been waiting to speak with you. So here is the question. Uh, when we talk about behavioral science right, right now, and in places where it is not as popular or as well known, uh, you always hear something back, right? And it's, ah, oh, behavioral science. My grandma knows that very well, right? So uh, there is a certain uh, danger to the social sciences uh, where things feel very, very obvious the moment you hear the answer. Uh, what would you like to uh, tell? Does my grandma really knows behavioral science? Yes. Um, probably my mum was one of the best behavioral scientists I've ever come across uh, in the sense that um, it, I don't know quite how to put this, but I always said to my mum, she could spot someone who was having an extramarital affair at 500 yards. You know, she, she'd pick up on some tiny thing and she'd say, um, you know, I, th I think there's something a bit funny going on between them. Every girl, don't be ridiculous. You've got no evidence. You've got no evidence for that. How, what on earth possibly makes you think? And then sure enough, there'd be this really bitterly contested divorce four months later, you know. And my mum had spotted something that none of us could have spotted. And when you say that, that um, Nassim Taleb is very big on this as well, that actually ancestral wisdom and um, even things like proverbs, metaphors, um, and parables contain a lot of wisdom in narrative form. And I think, I'm, since I wrote the book, I'm starting to realize why this is. And it's because... Um, talking to an investment advisor called John O'Shaughnessy, he said, the thing is, we're a determinate, we've got deterministic brains working in a probabilistic universe, okay? And that part of our brain, not the whole part, the part that education tends to favor, the part that we, you, we use to do the talking and the writing, broadly speaking, loves to frame things in kind of Newtonian, deterministic or even binary forms. There's this and there's that. It's not very good at ambiguity, it's not very good at complexity. And in reality, what you get is people who are trying to impose, and I would argue economics is doing this, impose Newtonian certainty on complex environments where that kind of maths has no place. Now what's interesting is, what I always say about what we do in behavioral science, I start off, I say, look, it's a bit of a crap science, okay? Um, in many ways, it doesn't give you absolutely reliable predictions on what will work. So if you're looking for something with a level of certainty of kind of aeronautics or, you know, a thermodynamics or something, okay, forget it, okay? Where the value of behavioral science lies is that it will mass, if you pair it with creativity, it will massively expand the possible solution space for any problem you have. Because once you accept that the problem may have a psychological dimension or a perceptual dimension, not just a material dimension, scope lies for all the magic and all the messiness of complex systems. And those would be butterfly effects, for example, where small things have very big effects. Um, it could be um, 
another thing, but you know, so um, it could be, but the other thing that you find in complex systems, okay, you don't get laws, but you get recurring patterns. And it suddenly occurs to me that stories in many ways exist because a story like you know, even Little Red Riding Hood or one of those things, you know, one of those sort of the, the five, six, seven big stories, they're a way of capturing a pattern that's recurring. And what I often argue is, look, we're not in the business of laws, we're in the business of pattern recognition. And quite a lot of these patterns already exist, but what we haven't done is codify them in a way where we can deploy them somewhere else. And, and occasionally, what I find utterly fascinating and why I make no apology for working in consumer capitalism is that you can spot patterns at a tiny level which recur somewhere really big. So here's another billion dollar company, which is really interesting in economic terms, because it makes no sense. Five Guys. Okay, now, if you look at Five Guys pricing, they charge a fortune for the burger. I mean, the burger is fucking, oh, sorry. Uh, the burger is insanely, expensive. okay, it's like eight or nine pounds. Now, McDonald's, you know, wouldn't, you know, people were basically, if McDonald's tried to charge Five Guys prices for a burger, people would walk out, right? But where they're quite clever, okay, is they charge a huge amount for the burger, but it's the burger that really makes them different. That's the thing. Now, interestingly, all the other things, other than cheese and bacon, are either free or really cheap, except the milkshake. That's one I buy. So the fries, they insanely give you a huge, generous, extra portion of fries for free on top of the ones filling the cup you've asked for. Refills are completely free from the drinks machine. Peanuts are completely free. And... Um, all the other toppings on the burger, brown sauce, jalapenos, those are all free as well. And it's a really weird way of pricing until you realize that what it's doing is it's getting, you can get people to pay a lot more for the thing they really care about if you don't charge them that much for everything else. And so it's, a, uh, and my argument is you can take that insight and you can deploy it to, um, uh, you can deploy it to tax. What would happen if invisible taxes like VAT maintain things like, um, you know, defense or, you know, th things that people aren't so emotive about? And income tax all went to the National Health Service. So you reframe the income tax as the National Health Tax, okay? It would totally change the way people felt about paying that money because the money was going to the burger, in this case, National Health, not going on the fries. And so in, I'll, I'll tell you a similar story about this, about someone using that pattern. Um, John Maynard Keynes, who was, by the way, a very good behavioral scientist. I mean, like Adam Smith, both of them were really interested in the psychology of what was going on. Okay. And John Maynard Keynes was the bursar of King's College, Cambridge. Now, King's College, Cambridge has King's College Chapel in Cambridge, which is a magnificent medieval chapel, which is world famous. And King's College, Chap uh, King's College also owns the Arts Theatre in Cambridge, which is a very good theatre, but it's just a theatre in Cambridge where students and outside people will put on performances. Okay. Both of them needed a million pounds. King's College Cambridge had one million pounds. So it could only satisfy half of the needs of the theatre and half the needs of the chapel. And King said, this decision is very, very easy, he said. We will give all of the million pounds to the arts theatre and then we'll fundraise for the chapel. Because he said, it's very easy to get rich people to put money towards one of the world's most famous ecclesiastical buildings. It's very hard for them to fund, get them to fund a provincial theatre. And so what he understood was that, you know, even altruism cares about where the money goes. And similarly, when we pay tax, we care about where the money goes, contrary to what economists think, that paying money to the NHS feels different than paying money towards road repair or something like that, okay? And in the same way, paying money towards a burger in Five Guys feels different. If, if the burgers were £5.50 and the fries were you know, more expensive and they didn't give you the free fries and you had to pay for each drink, Okay, you might end up spending exactly the same amount of money to get exactly the same meal, but you wouldn't be nearly as happy. And so I think there's something that what I always say about this is the reason stories are so important is that stories are like the PDFs of 
you know, it's like a PDF. It's easily shared. It's information in a form that's memorable and shareable and, and universal. And so the great thing with stories, I think, is we have stories to teach us how to... So when people say the evidence is only anecdotal, I always go, fine. I can start with anecdotal. Okay, I'm not going to bet the farm on anecdotal, but penicillin was kind of anecdotal, right? Why are there these funny patches in my Petri dish where there aren't any bugs? You know, now you say, oh, that's anecdotal, okay? It's the, it's the very anecdotal things where every time I do this, a weird thing happens, which are often the origins of billion dollar businesses because someone stumbled on some human insight that because it's counterintuitive, no one else has even experimented in that space. Dyson, whoever thought there was a market for $700 vacuum cleaners? Zoom, by the way, okay? Now, Zoom is fascinating because, you know, I mean... <laughs> As most of the investors who are approached by Zoom said, you're moving into a space which is already mature, which has dominant players in the shape of Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, to an extent Amazon with Twitch, okay, and, and so on, okay? They all offer a product for free, and you're trying to produce a product that you charge for. So what likelihood do you think is there that you'll succeed? And yet Zoom just created a product which was technologically 20% better, but it was also psychologically maybe 50% better. You clicked on a link so even your Luddite idiot colleague could probably manage to attend a Zoom meeting without cocking it up, okay? Whereas basically, if you tried to do a kind of Skype call with five other people, the first 20 minutes of the meeting were basically IT support. No, Dave, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dave. You know, no. have you tried plugging that in? You know, and that just basically, by taking it across the threshold of shittiness, Zoom managed to create this whole well, they're now worth $16 billion. What, you know, what, what, what can I say? All those rational people who said, what hope do you have? Well, they're not billionaires and Eric is. Uh, by the way, the person who says five guys prices put you off, uh, it's worth a try. You will seriously actually enjoy it. Um, I, I, I get your point. But um, uh, um, if you try it once, you'll kind of weirdly become, re, you know, you'll get a re-anchoring point where somehow... To be honest, it probably works out net, depending on what you eat and how much. But actually, it probably ends up being McDonald's times two. But, I, but, I, but, it, but strangely, you kind of accept it because you're paying the money for where it really makes a difference. Ah, stop planning and measuring activities. Lovely. Okay. Mm. Who wants to ask the next question? Or, or Louise, do you want to ask one? Or, or oh. who's keen? Yes, ab ab absolutely, Rory. So um, let's maybe bring this up all to the current situation that we're in, Rory. We've had a good chat about so many things. Well, you've had fantastic Sutherland gold today. I'm just going to say this is just tip top. But Harmony was chatting with me earlier and she said, which aspects of alchemy can be applied to find solutions to appeal to non-believers? in mask wearers, Rory. What's your opinion uh, by the on way, this? I have to confess something here, which is I don't really understand the opposition to mask wearing. I mean, certainly you, you might argue that outdoors it's unnecessary and actually slightly unpleasant, and that, that I, but indoor mask wearing in public spaces seems to me completely self-evident and indeed should have been recommended from the beginning on common sense grounds on the grounds that if you think this is an airborne disease and may even be an airborne disease in the air, not only in um, saliva particles, not only in aerosol form, but in the air, um, uh, then it seems to me that since the worst examples of the disease seem to involve entering the lungs or, or um, you know, the esophagus, then something that both restricts movement in and restricts movement out kind of makes obvious sense. And so the opposition to it, um, my colleague Chris Graves can explain it better, but I don't fully understand the opposition to it. I, I, I wish I could. Um, uh, because the, the one thing that is interesting about that is a framing question, which is my prior acquaintance with mask wearing in public 
was usually, except when I went once to Japan and once went to Shanghai, it was nearly always of Oriental tourists traveling in London. And my interpretation of it instinctively was that it was slightly rude because you're saying that the people around you are unclean and you're trying to protect yourself from their filthy guaylo germs, okay? And what I didn't understand, and someone told me this, that they'd been to an event in Japan where only the, um, uh, the only mask wearer in the room was the, was the interpreter. And he said, why is the interpreter wearing a mask? Is this something that interpreters do? You know, like, you know, is this some sort of normal thing that you impose on a live interpreter? They said, no, no, she's got a cold. So she doesn't want anybody else to catch her cold. And he had, as I did, this same kind of Damascus Road revelation, which oh, I see it's done to benefit other people, not to benefit the wearer. It's a pro-social thing, which, of course, in Japan makes perfect sense. It's a very pro-social culture. Okay. But up until that point, I'd always seen it as being a bit of an, a mildly as an insult to your fellow man, because it suggested I'm obviously a clean person, but you might not be. And it was only when I heard this story, there was another interesting story with relation to COVID, which is it never occurred to me that the phrase herd immunity would cause such a scandal because I'd heard the phrase before and I was familiar with it as a medical term. But if you'd never heard the phrase before, which, by the way, was probably true of most journalists, because being a journalist is shorthand for someone who isn't much good at science, generally, okay? And because most journalists hadn't heard the phrase herd immunity because they hadn't done any prior reading on immunology, they thought, God, you're referring to people as cattle. This is appalling. You know, this is like kind of Nazi stuff to refer to your population as if they were cows, okay? And of course, I, when I heard the phrase herd immunity, I mean, of course, herd immunity, you know, 60%, blah, 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 it seemed to be perfectly standard because I'd heard the phrase before in different contexts. And you can never forget that in advertising, by the way, where something that seems like absolutely standard speech to you or standard behavior <laughs> seems really egregious to someone else because they're interpreting it in a totally different way. And so there's something that really interests me there, which is... Um, that um, I, I, to be honest with the masks, um, if you, I think there may be some scope to putting messages on them, which say things like, I'm doing this for you, not for me, or I'm wearing this for my gran, not, you know, not for me. So making the point that it's altruistic, because I genuinely don't fully, un I, I mean, I, I would be concerned, I think, uh, if it were the case that you had to wear them, say, outdoors in the garden, in your own garden, among your own family, I could see that that would occasion a degree of inconvenience. But there are a few valuable things to it, one of which is, of course, it is a visual reminder so that when you see someone without a mask approaching you, you might be able to take evasive action by thinking, here's someone who doesn't take this very seriously, let's cross the street. So it is a visible mark of saying, I am someone who is taking this stuff seriously. And therefore, you can trust me to stay at a reasonable distance and not, you know, suddenly cough all over you or something. Um, you know, I'm not planning to go to a rave this evening if I'm wearing a mask. So it generally suggests a more reliable person. Um, the, the opposition to it um, in terms of wearing it in public spaces indoors, I, I truly can't understand. I, I don't understand that. Um, I don't know where it's come from. It seems to be a perversion of sort of libertarianism. Um, you know, I sometimes wonder, there is a difference, of course, in the US, if you think about it, which is the US hasn't really had anything on home turf in 150 years equivalent to rationing or the blackout, for example. Okay, where... Look, there are certain things where it just pays to go along with the flow. You know, the, the mild and... I mean, this is part of the reason I'm, I, I'm... My argument is I will continue to work from home for quite a long time, which is not that I think it makes a huge difference, but simply that it makes some difference at very, very low cost, OK? So my argument is I'm doing a perfectly obvious value exchange here, which is if you ask me to go and fight in the trenches in order to possibly save 0.5% you know, of a life, um, I'd be you know, a little bit uncomfortable about that. But if you're asking me to, you know, to undergo what is somewhere between a mild pleasure and a very small inconvenience to achieve the same effect, 
to me, it just seems ridiculous, um, ridiculous economics, actually, not to make a trade off of that kind. And, I, and so where, where do people, is there anybody here who's, by the way, a mask opponent? Um, because I, I'm intrigued to know, you know, where, what, where it comes from, because I, I, I don't fully understand it. Um, I mean, it's not virtue signaling, really. It, I mean, okay, I mean, the point is that if you are, my, my argument for mask wearing now is next week, it's my dad's 90th birthday, okay? So I don't want to catch it now to a point where I may be asymptomatically infectious when I'm within 10 feet of him. So to me, if you have any kind of elderly relatives, it seems so obvious that you do this simply on the precautionary principle and the cost of doing it is so low. I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, equally, I mean, you know, people react weird. Virtue signaling thing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's cool, being neutral on it. Um, is, it is it an identity? What is undoubtedly true, okay, is that identity, Abraham Lincoln made this point, that if you asked a man to go about town wearing his wife's bonnet for a day on his head, Okay, um, he would experience something akin to physical pain, even though the only thing he was suffering was embarrassment. And so there is this vital thing, which I think is highly significant, uh, which is that social embarrassment, okay, uh, is an unbelievably potent force in all things. There are lots of drinks that we really, really like that we don't drink and we don't order in bars because we're embarrassed asking for them, okay? You know, I always say half jokingly that one of the reasons Coke is so magically successful as a brand is you can ask for it in any setting without embarrassment, okay? You know, I can't go into a Michelin three star restaurant and say, Could I have a diet, diet Dr. Pepper, okay? And I couldn't say, I want a Bailey's or a triple sec or whatever, okay? There are loads and loads of things which we don't do because social norming um, simply creates that feeling of pain. Um, through social awkwardness. And it's one of the things that I think needs to be explored much, much more uh, in terms of uh, understanding behavior. Because let's take this to the extreme, okay? There are cases where people have died on planes in the cockpit because they can see that the pilot who's their superior is heading towards a mountain or crashing or doing something wrong, but they can't find the language to actually correct him. These are about three cases. It was particularly prevalent in Korean flights because Korean is a language with very, very strong um, inbuilt deference. So you use completely different verb forms to speak to a senior than you do to a junior. So it's not just tu or vu or what is it, z or, or du in German, okay? This is something where the whole language is infused with either deference, with, with, with status, okay? And so social embarrassment, social awkwardness, I mean... <laughs> Okay, a little bit of self-analysis here. You know, there are occasions where, you know, people have had friends who are drinking too much or are alcoholic and nobody has the conversation. You know, and they, I, one, one of my friends subsequently died for that reason. And nobody has the conversation because it just feels awkward. Okay. And um, one of our Ogilvy um, uh, campaigns is called Ask Twice. So when you ask someone, how are you feeling? The standard thing is, how are you feeling? Yeah, fine. You've done the duty, you've asked how they're feeling, forget about it from now on. And it's only when you say, are you, sh are you sure you're fine? That you might get someone to come clean about the fact they've been suffering from anxiety or depression. And therefore by talking about it, it's more likely that you can make allowance for it and help. But in the same way, I mean, there are many, many behaviors like wearing, you know, if I asked any of you to go around, I mean, what do we dream about? Sometimes we dream about monsters, but just as often we dream about walking around having forgotten to put trousers on. OK, you know, it even infects our dreams. So that business that I don't want to look like the kind of person who wears a mask. Uh, is a really tough one. Um, then, then, now, there may be mask designs, OK, 
which counterbalance that you know maybe what you need is the hell's angels to issue a mask or you need someone with a massive sense of individuality you know some brand with a huge sense of individuality millwall football club in the uk okay you know <laughs> no one likes us we don't care they would be the kind of people who you may need to get involved in this credibly in the same way that if you're marketing uh, non-alcoholic beers you use billy connolly okay you don't use, you know, someone particularly virtuous. So finding a celebrity there to overcome that would be really, really interesting. Bruce Willis, you know, someone objectionably right wing would be quite useful, by the way, wouldn't they? You know, if you just get a guy who goes, look, I'm not doing this for me, okay? I don't really like it. I don't want people to think I'm some sort of so-and-so, but my mum's 80. So, you know, if this is all I have to do, this is what I do, you know? And so maybe the appeal just needs to be reframed to a different audience. In the same way, there's a, I'll give you a beautiful example of this. You're talking to religious people, right? If you talk about environmentalism to religious people, basically they turn off. I mean, this is typically evangelical Christians in the US. And they go, a bunch of tree-hugging lefty, free love merchants, don't want to have anything to do with what they do. If you change the language and you talk about stewardship of the planet, which is using language they recognize and respect, the entire reaction to the debate changes. You know, we have a duty to steward, you know, as, as stewards of the planet. You know, we patently have a duty to look after it, not to treat it badly. That's a different language to essentially kind of what a lot of people suspect is anti-capitalist um, beliefs wrapped up in environmental clothing, which some of it is, by the way, too. And those people who hijack campaigns are actually quite damaging to the campaigns in some cases. Well, thank you, Rory. Uh, I, I think we could probably go on here all day, but we have to respect your time. Um, I'm just going to finish up on a question, which is, again, specifically about the book, as uh, that's what's drawn us all together in this group. And uh, we had a good question from one of our members, Bren Brennan. Um, oh, and one other question. You, you, we, we never got round to the um, dictation. Oh, go ahead. Go so, ahead. No, no. So, no, no. So, ask me, ask me both. Uh, ask me the dictation question. Well, that was. Uh, is, is Prakash there? Yes, I'm here. So, uh, essentially, uh, Rory, uh, yes. what happened was you had put this lovely video with two questions to us. The first was, uh, why did it take a pandemic for us to start yes. using Zoom? And. Uh, you know, it seems so obvious now. And the second question was, <coughs> some behaviors are going to change uh, and some would not, right? So which are the ones you think are going to change, which would not? And we had a strong discussions around this, like hundreds of answers in the club. And I happened to hear you tell about the story of this dictaphone, which you picked up <coughs> and you experimented with it, right? The five minute, yeah. and I want to tell, I want you to tell the story to us. So this extraordinary thing, which is when, it, I've used this comparison before, which is we we never notice how slow typing is because when we're typing quite fast, we think we're going fast because we're comparing it not to speaking. We're comparing it to typing. OK, in the same way, if if you went on a speedboat at 30 knots, OK, you go, Wee, this is so fast. It's incredibly exciting. Wow. Look how fast we're going. Now, nobody does that at a car in at 30 miles an hour. Except a Labrador, admittedly. A Labrador will stick its head out of the window and go, wow, this is really cool. But humans don't get excited at 30 miles an hour. We just think it's slow, okay? On land. But on a boat, we think it's incredible. And so, in the same way as we don't compare things very well across domains. And the extraordinary thing that happened is I had to write, I'm just, I've just dictated another one. Now, by the way, it's not a punk dictaphone. There's a German company that sells interesting windshields uh, with punk kind of punk coloration. So I, I bought that, I couldn't resist it and put it on the top because I quite often record out of doors when I'm going for a walk. So the windshield's quite useful. So what I did is I have to write 625 words for the spectator. And I thought, okay, um, let's just try dictating this because I discovered otter.ai, which is a pretty good um, AI based transcription tool. Okay. And I thought, okay, so I can walk around and just dictate this thing. So I dictated my spectator off. 625 words is what you needed. I spoke for about five minutes, 30 seconds. Okay. And I thought, okay, that's probably about a third of it. 
plugged it in, plugged it into Otter AI. It was 900 and something words. I went, no, no, this is, this is crazy. This thing must be just inventing words and putting them in the middle. And it wasn't. That was what I'd said in five minutes, 40. And I did it this time and I did it for 10 minutes. And I ended up with something like 1,500, 1,600 words. Now, I was talking to Nassim Taleb about this because he was, a, last night, he was unconvinced. But I said, the other great thing is, if you think about it, okay, you've still got to spend a bit of time editing, but editing's a lot nicer than typing. You know what I mean? You know, it, it, it's, you know it's rather like, you know, the, the business when you're doing a sculpture and you're chipping a little bit away here, and chip, that's quite enjoyable. It's the business where you've got to carve off great hunks of stuff, you know, that's the painful hard work. And I suddenly realized that, first of all, we always delay writing for too long because the first task of writing is the worst bit, which is getting a thousand words down or out of our head and through the keyboard onto the screen. Now, once you've got twice as many words as you need, now, okay, you need to edit some of them, you need to replace others, but 80% of the back of that job has been broken. Now, theoretically, by the way, what this means, and I literally mean this, okay, if, we, if I recorded this conversation, which I haven't, but you have, okay, if you take the voice recording and you upload it to otter.ai and the whole conversation of this thing, what it suggests, I think, from this conversation is if you produced a direct transcript, you would have a hardback book of, of 100,000 words after about 10 hours conversation. So theoretically, okay, if you were a genius, you could write a book in a day. Now, you'd have, you know, I don't, there, there was one person I know who could more or less do this. He was a brilliant journalist in the UK called A.A. A. Gill, and he tragically died about a year ago. But someone told me that A.A. A. Gill was so brilliant at this that when he submitted his, his weekly restaurant review to the Sunday Times, he was the last person to regularly use the transcription desk at the Times. He rang the copy desk at the Times and said, it's A.A. A. Gill here, my restaurant review coming up. And he read about 850 words straight off, barely pausing to edit, said, that's it, put down the phone. They counted the words. They tended to be about 820 to 870. And he went back to having a drink. Now, okay, I don't, Drayton Bird, by the way, did everything. Who's my great guru, the great direct response copywriter. He did everything by voice dictation. And my argument is Zoom and voice dictation are two potential white collar productivity bombs, which could potentially improve the productivity and effectiveness of um, white collar work, particularly if we get rid of email or replace email with spoken messages. Or even better, an email would be a transcript. Um, an email would be automatically a summation, a transcript and a recording, okay? What if you did that? What, would it, what effect would it have on productivity? The weird thing is, we didn't, I did, I'm proud to say, I did Zoom experiments two years ago because I thought this is a big deal. I Personally, I've got two selfish reasons. I'm currently by the seaside in an apartment in Deal. So if we can get a bit of remote working going, uh, what it means is I can bunk off to the seaside on Thursday evening, work from, work from the seaside on Friday and spend the whole weekend by the sea. So a bit of selfish motivation, okay? But also I said, look, if you, we have different kinds of work. If you work from home one day a week or maybe two, you will be more productive than if you work from home naught days a week because you're in a variety of settings and you can do the work that's suited to the setting. Sometimes you want solitude, sometimes you want sociability. Okay, so varying the setting in which you work will fundamentally change the type of work you can do. And so that fact that you could write a, you could write a hardback book in a day if you're a brilliant dictator uh, I, I mean, a brilliant act dictation, okay, is really interesting because it's just that we ought to practice this, that schools ought to teach it. And I've got a bit better at it. I mean, I was lucky when, when it came in because I've done a few radio programs for Radio 4, and so I've at least had practice talking to inanimate objects, which is a bit difficult at first. It feels really weird. But my argument here is what's so weird about Zoom isn't that it's proved to be fantastically useful during a pandemic. It's that it took a pandemic for us to discover what a miraculous thing it is. And by the way, in terms of international wealth redistribution, okay, are you in India or are you in the UK? Um, we are, in fact, a good number of people are, are from the India here right now. 
Okay, right. I mean, basically, I should be saying this, okay. But I mean, you can perform, you can now set up Indian-based service industries or professional services firms. Let's <laughs> wipe the floor with us bastards. I can't, I, you, okay, it wasn't me who told you this. But seriously, right? Now, one of the interesting things is that I, from Ogilvy in London, have had a much more international existence um, since the pandemic started, even though I've hardly left Kent. Miro, someone's mentioned Miro, very good, very good observation. There's another one called Mural as well. Um, and those are all technologies which brainstorming remotely is really, really good. Okay. One of the interesting things is we, we, I'm now doing a little bit of work with our Indian agency um, on ITC in behavioral science field. Um, at the same time, um, uh, we have colleagues from Mumbai and Tbilisi and Sydney uh, and the West Coast who are all working with us. And actually, you can form these virtual teams over Zoom. You, you'll never do it over the phone and you'll never do it over email, but you can do it over Zoom. And um, uh, it really is, um, you know, I mean, it deserves 50% as much attention as the invention of the web, as, as a game-changing technology for business, particularly for professional businesses. I mean, okay, I'd never meet the people from Ogilvy Tbilisi normally because it's, un, you know, it's unlikely that, uh, you know, it would ever be worth the cost of an air ticket to go and see them, okay? You know, if you put a hurdle, if you imagine what, what the world was like before, we had all these textual, free, asynchronous modes of communication. Then there was this yawning gap in the market until you got to getting on a plane or a train, which cost a fortune and took three days of your life. And if you imagine a city where the only ways of getting around are rickshaw and limousine, okay, you can either pay like, you know, $30, you know, uh, to, to go an hour or $30 a mile to go in a limousine, or you can pay, you know, a few rupees to go in a rickshaw and there's nothing in between. Someone would spot the fact that there must be a gap in the market here. Well, there has to be a gap in the market in between face-to-face -face meetings involving $4,000 air tickets and talking to someone on the phone. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it's so self-evident, and yet the pressure, until you have necessity, the pressure to experiment just isn't there. Uh, thank you. Rory, you, mm. uh, you know, you're telling about this, uh, in fact, even the way you define alchemy, looking beyond those rules which are set up. And we wanted to tie this back to your question, why did it take a pandemic? And I remember mm. trying to teach my daughter how to color within those lines, those drawings, right? She's in um, KG now, kindergarten. And she drew outside the lines and I tell her, that's wrong. You're supposed to draw inside the line. And she's a child, right? She looks up yeah. at me and says, what's wrong with drawing outside the line, right? And I think a lot of us stop uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, drawing outside the line as you grow up. And so it, it takes, I think someone like you who can say, I can use a dictaphone for doing this, experiment it. Yes. Of us don't. And this club is full of people who are very, very interested in behavioral science. Some of us are professors in PhDs and double masters, but some of us have just heard the name Rory Sutherland and <coughs> their first book. So it's an entire range of people, almost thousand people in this club. Uh, what would you want to tell us? Uh, oh. How do we do this journey? How do we keep on drawing out to the line? Yours. First, first of all, let's let's gather this club I, I didn't know the club existed i'm so gratified I, I think it's also a zoom enabled club isn't it in that it'd be difficult for you to create this kind of worldwide entity previously you know okay you could have had a slack space you could have had a kind of you know in the old days of the internet you could have had a usenet forum and it would have been okay you know you could do this sort of thing on um uh, you know uh, on a few chat spaces with a bit of social media but this makes it fundamentally different and um because here's my thing. This is particularly valuable um, here, this club. And I would like to affiliate Ogilvy with this club and possibly sponsor the club or do anything I can do to help for several reasons, which is that because I think we're in the business of pattern recognition and the interesting thing about behavioral ideas is that they're kind of additive. The real job of behavioral science, as I said, isn't to say I've come up with this new law and it's unfailing and true. The real job of behavioral science is to expand the possible solution space for solving 
behavioral issues like mask wearing, or as I said, whether people buy chocolate or not. You know, and I, my argument is that you might as well use the trivial behavior that consumers manifest to look for recurring patterns somewhere else. And, you know, if you think about it, Darwin, you could have said of Darwin, what are you doing going around some obscure islands looking at the beaks of finches? You know, it's a waste of time. But it's actually looking at the, looking at the economy like, a, like the Galapagos Islands and having the mind of a naturalist when you look at human behavior is really the right way to go about it. So the great thing about international cooperation here is that this is an additive discipline. It isn't one like much of academia where one person ends up proving themselves right and everybody else is proven wrong. Okay. The great thing about this is it isn't kind of, um, you know, in a way I don't even want, I, mean, I even say to academics, I say to academics, look, have you got any kind of shit findings that don't really match up to p-values and that, you know, where the research is a bit messy and you're not very sure, but there might be something in it? Because I'm interested in those, okay? I don't think we should be trying to form an exact science because human behavior is so contextually determined that you can never actually confidently legislate how people will behave in a particular setting. Um, and so, you know, it's like herd, herd, herd in immunity, you know, a third of people go, yeah, herd immunity. And 70% of people go, what? You're calling us cattle. Okay. And so, you know, my argument is that it, this is really, a, you know, ultimately its value lies in fostering new and creative ideas because, because, uh, and, and also providing the ammunition to test counterintuitive things. These counterintuitive things don't work or don't work reliably, but when they do work, they pay off magnificently because you've really learned something. You've had to revise your previous expectations. So this community, by the way, I think is fabulous. And um, how often do you meet? Uh, we meet uh, twice a month on the first and third Saturdays. We either chit chat, or we put up a show or when we're lucky, someone like yourself joins us. Uh, but the threads are alive with discussions, I mean, 24-7. We have people from all the six continents. Uh, it'll be lovely if someone in Antarctica is like, you know what, I want to understand behavioral science. Mm. Uh, the range is, is, is mad because, like I told you, some people are like, I, I have heard the name Rory Sutherland. I think he has a book. And then there are people who are PhDs and double masters. There are people who run companies. There are planners. There are marketeers. And there are people like Luis who are like uh, full of energy and keeping the entire group together. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's quite an eclectic mix bunch. Uh, they all love behavioral science. And I think uh, one thing which we all are agreeing is it's not a magic solution where behavioral science corrects no. uh, everything. And you were saying about incorrect experiments and we talk about uh, those things a lot in the group so that we don't go under the illusion of knowledge. So we take pains to tell us about experiment in Australia where they put down, uh, they tried to prevent teenage pregnancies by giving those baby dolls, you know, live dolls. They're supposed yeah, to take and it backfired. Yeah. You know the story? Yeah, yeah. please yeah. share the story. People will love it. Yeah. Oh, so I'm fairly sure that it was designed by being a kind of annoying Tamagotchi to discourage teenage pregnancy by teaching teenage girls what a pain it was to bring up a child. But it had the opposite effect, if I'm right. It made them want to get pregnant because having tried the plastic version, they wanted a real one. Yes. And so and it had absolutely the opposite effect to that which you'd predict. And it was five years of doing this till someone said, you know what, let me just test this, right? Because it seems so correct intuitively. And it is using examples like this that we are able to talk to our clients and say, you know what, it's not really grandmother's wisdom. I mean, it is, but well, what? Yes, uh, it kind of is. Um, in the sense that generally, um, I think what you might call ancestral wisdom mm -hmm. ha does have a strong element of kind of uh, capturing certain patterns. Um, and of course, the fact that, the fact that sometimes um, proverbs are contradictory is in keeping with that it's that people will often react in, an, in you know in a in two different ways 
I mean, the way I always phrase this is, in the real world, in complex systems, okay, A, you have butterfly effects, B, there's more than one answer to a problem, C, stranger still, the opposite of a good idea isn't wrong, it might be another good idea. So, that, you know, sometimes if you want to reassure people, you write a very short letter or you write a very long one. You know, there are cases where, strangely, the effect is not linear, it's not remotely linear. And so the fact non-linearities are annoying to purist scientists because they make the world messy, but they're exciting to entrepreneurs because it's in psychological arbitrage that opportunities lie. You see, if I can think of something that, I, that people want, but which you never think that people would really want, okay, then I'm going to make a fortune, right? Even if only 10% of people are weird enough to want it, that's enough. If an anomaly is true for 10, 15, 20% of people, that's good enough to found a business on, okay? It doesn't need to be true for everybody. And so I often say that capitalism is in many ways a better problem-solving mechanism than science is, because it allows for more than one solution, and it rewards people disproportionately the more unexpected their solution is. You know, Red Bull, crazy idea, horrible tasting drink, cost a fortune, comes in a tiny can, okay? The very fact that you're the only person mad enough to try that means that when you do succeed, you make billions, literally. And so I think, um, the other thing I'd like to predict, by the way, is I think India will be a complete powerhouse for this. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, I think it's an area where India could become world leading very, very quickly in this whole area. Um, because culturally, you have the right attitude, right approach to, uh, right uh, um, acceptance of ambiguity, okay? It, you know, it, do you see what I mean? If you look at that Hofstede stuff, there are cultures which have a higher tolerance of ambiguity and cultures with a much lower tolerance. And I think this always works a bit better in countries where people go, well, maybe it's a bit of one thing, it's a bit of the other. You know, where people aren't trying to um, essentially shoehorn everything into a kind of Newtonian framework all the time. Now, uh, thank you uh, for all the kind words, Rory. Uh, see, uh, what's happening is with this club, uh, we, we do run, um, apart from this club, I mean, Louise and me and all the people out here, we also do uh, behavioral science uh, in India and Bangalore. Uh, you were earlier talking about how you are now working with ITC in India, which would have never happened. And many of us see things like that happening. Uh, we also work with people in Brazil, in, in Peru, Lima, and Bangkok, and this was never possible before. Mm. You're saying India is going to be a, 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 you know, a fantastic powerhouse. Uh, what we have found is like there were people in Peru, right, who are now, it's a one guy, one person now, they say, I want to tell people about behavioral science and he's getting in touch with people from Mexico who trained a little bit down with Danny really, right? He's pulling all those people in and talking about behavioral science. There's someone in Brazil, uh, Mateos, right? He's trying to see him with Meraki group. A uh, few days back, someone from Manila reached out to be saying, uh, Prakash, uh, can we work together because we want to talk to the government in Philippines about behavioral science. So I think it, it is just spreading around the world and um, education, like people like yourself who are the industry leaders, I think uh, you are doing a fantastic job already. Uh, there are thousands of us out here in this group and we are very, very happy that uh, you took no, this time. Well, I mean, it genuinely, it genuinely, because it's additive, it isn't one of those things like academia where one person ends up with a Nobel Prize and everybody else be, ends up being proved wrong, okay? True. It is genuinely, I think, uh, it's a discipline where generosity pays. And, um, uh, and so I think, um, uh, I think it's a really interesting field for collaboration and it's a really interesting field for, as I said, this whole new um, possibility made, made possible by Zoom. It's great for Ogilvy, by the way, because one thing Ogilvy has always had, without bragging, is it's had a fantastically um, constant culture. So if you talk to Ogilvy people from anywhere, um, they're basically the same kind of people. You know, it's a very, very common um, cultural thing. Now, David always had this dream of kind of long corridors where people would work across borders. And the truth of the matter is, it's only now that I think that dream becomes properly fulfilled. Um, because, um, and interestingly, I talked to a friend who was worked at Goldman Sachs, and he said the problem we always had at Goldman Sachs is he said there were 10 of us who were really, really keen on behavioral science. He said, but two of us were in London, one was in Hong Kong, one was in Melbourne, you know, one was in Delhi. 
you know, and so essentially you could never really form a community because at the time, this was five or six years ago or seven years ago, you didn't have the technology to actually form a team. Whereas now I think, gen now how, how payment works is a real, what we need to invent now, as someone said, Nunchstock had 120,000 attendees. So we were forced to go virtual by dint of the coronavirus. And we did this massive 14 hours of behavioral science starting in Melbourne and ending up in Hawaii. And 120,000 people, not, I mean, not all of them watched for 14 hours. I mean, that'd be crazy. I mean, even I didn't watch for 14 hours because I needed a little bit of a snooze at one point. But the point is that, you know, it suddenly became a stadium event. And I think it's really important because um, uh, just, um, just the whole idea... Um, oh, th someone's made the point about the numbers. Yeah, you're right. 35,000 people signed up the day before. And then on the day itself, when we started streaming through LinkedIn live and also through YouTube live, basically it seems that another sort of um, something like 80,000 people turned up. Um, and so um, uh, obviously it was free. Okay. But equally, there's a really important point. Most conferences aren't free because you know, they're expensive to put on. You've got to rent a hotel. You, and then as a result, what ends up happening is the people who attend conferences are the very people who don't need to be there. It's all the most senior people go. And really, it should be people 10 years younger who should be going. And I said, the great thing about this is I said, we don't have to worry about targeting at all. We've got no restriction on the size of the venue. I said, we're just going to market this to everybody. I said, if people watch with their kids, you know, if people brought... Occasionally in the past, people would ask to bring their kids to Nunchstock. And we'd always go, oh, the trouble is, if we allow a kid to go, that means that the marketing director of so-and-so can't go. So, we, you know, maybe we better say no. And I get, look, if someone watches with their kids, that's, you know, an Ogilvy recruit 10 years down the line. I'm not, you know, think, you know, think like a Jesuit. You know, <laughs> get them young. Who cares? You know, the audience, is, you know, the audience can be as big as we like. And I think this is genuinely quite big. And I think it's, it's also genuinely necessary because having enough people who go essentially who are happy enough to try counterintuitive things and occasionally then have evidence as to why the apparently logical reaction may not always be the best thing, I think is hugely important. Oh, someone here forced their husband to watch. This is absolutely brilliant. Um, absolutely lovely. Who's a convert into the awesomeness? I'm intrigued by this. Someone, someone from Amsterdam watched the full 14 hours. The last, four, the last few hours were a bit blurry. Uh, that may not have been the technology, um, actually, Andy. Uh, could have been, uh, been drink-related. I'm, I'm not going to make a prediction about that. <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, it's, uh, by the way, it's still there to watch. So it's, uh, it, it's fabulous. And so um, I, think there's something, um, I think there's something really interesting about this. And that... Um, uh, it, th that actually one of the great things is simply driving open the solution space. You know, looking at taxation, standard economics assumes that we're just as happy to pay tax if it goes to the NHS versus if it goes to something we don't like. Um, you know, logic, uh, it, you know, behavioral science suggests that hypothecation of taxes is a really good idea. Um, and so I think it's, um, I think this is potentially, you know, it, it is a sort of large movement. And it, it's also, I think we need, to, we need to be very, very open in that people from evolutionary psychology have a huge con contribution to make. People from complexity theory, anybody who's interested just in complex systems, um, you know, people at the Santa Fe Institute have a huge contribution to make. Um, but the, the basic summation is, you know, we're always trying to cram a complex world into a Newtonian framework. And after a while, I would argue, maps tend to end up, those maps we devised start off being useful and they end up being misleading. You know, when you start off, a map's an aid to thinking. And over time, the map becomes embedded in wider and wider groups of people and it starts becoming an obstacle to thinking. Well, will I jump in there, Rory, and say thank you. It's been an absolute joy to listen to you here today. I wondered would we make an hour, and we're getting close into two. So um, I want to say thank you. You said about people being generous. You have been extremely generous to us, Rory. 
it pleasure. Was not pleasure. That started this whole journey. Wow. Um, if I hadn't watched Nudge Stop, I wouldn't have put up a list of books, which then Prakash would not have started the club in which to read the books. And just a month later, there's a thousand of us gathered together reading behavioral science books. So it's a joy. But also, Rory, if you hadn't responded to the rather cheeky email that I sent to Ogilvy, which was saying, just to let Ogilvy know that we've started this group and Rory might like to know that we've chosen his book as our first choice and you kindly stepped forward and got in the fray of the chat and said I'll make a video for you. You even volunteered to come along when we were chatting about the book but you thought that might be like an awkward guess. A bit weird, party. yeah. <laughs> so it's thank you, thank you. The fact that you're here talking to us is beyond our expectations and I feel that having been able to use your name as a bit of a wedge in the truth is that now the six books we're reading between now and December we have managed to convince Bree Williams, Adam Ferrier, Cass Sunstein, Patrick Fagan, that they would also like to come and talk to us. So thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Thank you to all of you for coming along to this Q&A today. A big old boola boss, that's what we say in Ireland, a boola boss. And I hope you'll come again, and I hope you'll all keep on throwing all your great comments into the group, because that's what we like to see. And um, hopefully we'll see you all back in this spot in two weeks' time. So give yourselves a clap for turning up. Give Rory and I'll bigger clap. We're all your number one fans, Rory, and thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. much. It's a huge pleasure. Sorry about the motorbike noise. I should have <laughs> chosen the window. So I'll say goodbye to everybody and we'll leave. The Bye, -bye everybody. Goodbye, Fantastic everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you all. Uh, Louise, are you there still? I think I think Louise is gone. Uh, to the few remaining 16, 17 people, thank you all. For everyone else, we shall put up a, a recording of this. We are also gonna. Uh, we had a live stream already. Um, there are more people who are coming down. Please uh, engage, please talk, please chat. Uh, this is our group. I mean, you know, this is like all, all us. And uh, like I was saying, right? I mean, you know this magical thinking. We all know there's narrative bias, which we all know uh, is the way our mind works. Uh, but we are human beings. We need our stories to survive. So I think when it comes to these two biases, we as a club probably will give ourselves a pass and say, you know what, we will believe in magic. And it's okay if we have a narrative bias in interpreting our stories because we need science. And we will take this as a sign to uh, continue and possibly start our own journeys for those who have not yet done it into the world of behavioral science. Um, thank you all, we'll see you soon. Right. Thank you. Thank good you. night, good day. Good Ciao. night.